The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, Hear another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenants and went on a journey. When vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to obtain his produce. But the tenants seized the servants, and one they beat, another they killed, and a third they stoned. Again he sent other servants, more numerous than the first ones, but they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, thinking, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and acquire his inheritance. They seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. What will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants when he comes? They answered him, He will put those wretched men to a wretched death and lease his vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the proper times. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? By the Lord has this been done, and it is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that will produce its fruit. The Gospel of the Lord. Keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Then the God of peace will be with you. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, St. Paul wrote these words of encouragement to the disciples in Philippi, which was a town in Macedonia. Paul had great affection for that church. It was the first community that he founded when he entered Europe around the year 50. And the Philippians, on their part, reciprocated Paul's affection by sending one of them, Epaphroditus, with gifts for the apostle while he was in prison. But before sending Epaphroditus home, Paul wrote his letter to thank the Philippians for their kindness and to exhort them to be ever more faithful, to be ever more faithful to the Christian way of life. And Paul's exhortation to fidelity is the central mission, central message, I should say, the central message of the Word of God this Sunday. Indeed, the Apostles' message provides the key for us to appreciate the way in which the Lord Jesus takes up the oracle of Isaiah in the first reading. It and the gospel, as it were, frame frame the passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And it is crucial, crucial that we heed its message. In the second half of the 8th century BC, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, as well as other peoples in the region, were in great fear because of the threat of the Assyrian army. The book of the prophet Isaiah links the people's distress and uneasiness with the fact that they have distanced themselves from God. They live without reference to him, forgetful of all he has done for them. The future looks bleak, for there is no sign of their heeding the prophet's call to conversion. Thus, Assyria is depicted in the book 
as a rod or a staff, a rod or a staff wielded by the Lord in anger. Today's text is a poem, a dialogue between God and his friend. Notice that the speaker who introduces the poem calls God his friend. Once again, we have God's people compared to a vineyard in which God had planted, he says, the choicest vines, the best. But God is heartbroken. He laments, what more was there to do for my, bit, for my vineyard that I had not done? Why, when I looked for the crop of grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? The Hebrew, the Hebrew has the meaning of poison berries. Why, when I looked for the crop of grapes, did it bring forth poisoned berries? And so God pronounces punishment. The vineyard will be ruined. So what were the grapes that God expected to see from his people? God's friend gives the answer. Judgment and justice. And the people did not judge wisely, nor were they just. They failed to yield the expected fruit. The Lord, the Lord Jesus, takes up this oracle and gives it a twist. It becomes the parable of the wicked tenants, and he puts himself in the story, and that's the twist. The parable recapitulates the history of the relationship of God with his people. Again and again, God the landowner sent his servants, the prophets, to obtain the landowner's produce. The judgment and justice God expected from his people. But the tenants abused the servants, as we heard, and ultimately would kill the son. But note, Jesus allows the chief priests and the elders to pronounce the punishment. And they answered him, he will put those wretched men to a wretched death and lease his vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the proper times. And Jesus affirms their decision. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that will produce its fruit. Dear friends, let us heed what the Lord says because today we are the Lord's vineyard. He formed us as his people, the church. And more particularly, we are a parish. And Christ expects us here at Our Lady of Hope Church to bear the fruits of justice and judgment. If we do not, then the kingdom of God will be taken away from us. And how horrible that would be to lose our place in the kingdom of God by distancing ourselves from God, by living without reference to him, and by forgetting all he has done for us. And what has he done for us? What has God done for us? He has saved us from everlasting punishment by his death and resurrection. He has saved us from that horrible judgment of eternal damnation. He continues to nourish us with the choicest of vines, his son, who is the true vine, who in his passion poured forth his precious blood, which you and I have the privilege to receive in Holy Communion. His body and blood is a pledge of everlasting life, of everlasting peace and well-being. Therefore, my friends, we must be a people, a parish, that produces good fruit. We're all in this together. So each of us is called, as St. Paul told the Philippians, to keep on doing what we have learned and received and heard and seen in him. Then the God of peace will be with us. This means living a life of Christian virtue. A life of Christian virtue. You know, a virtue is an habitual disposition, a firm disposition to do the good. That's what virtue is. An habitual and firm disposition to do the good. It allows the person not only to perform good acts, but to give the best of himself. You know, years and years ago, 
maybe when I was in high school, so far back now, the army had a wonderful slogan. I, I, I'm kind of surprised they did away with it, but you know, you know, um, advertisers always are looking for change, right? But they had a wonderful slogan that said, be all you can be in the army. Do you remember that? Be all you can be in the army. And uh, that was a very successful slogan. But you know, that slogan is exactly the same thing for being a disciple. Be all you can be as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Maybe I should get the diocese to fund that, you know, right? Be all you can be as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what God wants of us. That's what Christ wants of us. To flourish. To flourish as his people. Not to get by. Not to accept the average in our life. Not to settle. That's a, that's a current word. Not to settle. But to be the best. So a virtuous person gives the best of himself or herself. The virtuous person tends toward the good with all his sensory and spiritual powers. He pursues the good and chooses it in concrete actions. St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory of Nyssa, who was the brother of St. Basil the Great, right, said the goal of a virtuous life, the goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. The goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. We can want to do that only if we love him. Remember that Jesus said, and our experience, our everyday experience confirms this, that where your treasure is, there also will be your heart. There are four moral virtues, or we call them cardinal virtues. Prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. We will consider only the first two as they are mentioned in today's readings. So to exercise the judgment God expects of us, we must be prudent. The Catechism says that prudence disposes our reason to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. So not only to know it, to desire it, but to do it in the way we should. Moreover, it guides the other virtues by setting rule and measure. It's pretty much what I just said. And it is prudence that immediately guides the judgment of conscience. The prudent man determines and directs his conduct in accord with this judgment. In other words, we are always bound, always bound to follow our conscience. To say this, though, and this is important, presupposes that our conscience, which makes judgment about what is right and wrong, is well-formed. That's the key. It presupposes that the conscience is well-formed. And that formation, my friends, comes from the gospel and the teachings of the church, which we accept because of the theological virtues of faith, hope, and most of all, of love. It is because of my faith in God, my love for him, and my trust in his promise of everlasting life, that I freely conform my life according to his ways. That's what life is all about, conforming my life to God's ways. Prudence guides me to do that. The second moral virtue is justice. It consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbor. Justice toward God is called the virtue of religion. Justice toward men disposes one to respect the rights of each, of each person and to establish in human relationships the harmony that promotes equity with regard to persons and to the common good. Remember what I said earlier, we're all in this together. So the common good must be an important focus of our lives. If we are to be just toward God, we must take seriously the first three commandments in the Decalogue. God must be first. God must be first in my life, meaning that I give him the best of my time in prayer each day, and that I rely on nothing or no one else for my ultimate happiness. Also, that I constantly respect his name and wish to give him glory. And finally, that I offer him the worship that is his due, at least on Sundays and the Holy Days of Obligation. And we can do this even in this time of COVID. You know, thank God we're all here this morning. It's wonderful to see you all here in this church this morning. But if we weren't here for whatever reason, you know, we, we don't have the 
strict obligation to attend Mass on Sunday, but if we're at home, we should be watching the Mass and praying with the Mass. And if we can't do that, we should at least take up the readings of the Mass and pray with them on a Sunday, on a Sunday. And unless we have this disposition, my brothers and sisters, and do these things, we are being unjust toward God. Think of that. Now, justice toward my neighbor means that I respect the rights of my fellow man, his right to life and freedom, to the sanctity of his home, to his good name and honor, and to his material possessions. Christ takes the virtue of justice seriously. He summarized the whole meaning of the law and the prophets by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, all. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And these considerations of justice are very timely today because today, as we may know, is Respect Life Sunday. And since 1973, a horrible injustice, a horrible injustice, an abomination has been foisted on our country in the name of privacy and personal freedom. You know, think of it. Millions and millions, untold millions, I don't have the count, it's awful, it's even awful to contemplate it, but millions and millions of human lives have been taken through the unspeakable sin, through the unspeakable sin. And what does this mean? Well, first of all, a Catholic philosopher, Alice von Hildebrand, who's still alive and she's got to be 90 if she's a day, okay, wonderful, wonderful thinker. Alice von Hildebrand, if you don't know her, you you should know her, read the biography she did of her husband, Dietrich, The Soul of a Lion, wonderful, wonderful story. But she was at a lecture that I attended, and she said that the unspeakable sin is Satan's greatest triumph since the fall. Think of that. Satan's greatest victory since the fall. The unspeakable sin. And what does it also mean? It means that we as a species, as, a, as creatures of God, are killing ourselves. We've been killing ourselves. And the demographics show that this is true. Show that this is true. And it is horrible. It is horrible to take defenseless life where it should be the safest in the womb of a mother and take that life. Horrible. So unjust that it cries out to the Lord. You know, and that's the the part of the, in, in the measure of justice, being so unjust, absolutely horrible. But on the other side is God's mercy. That all those who have been touched by this sin, and there are many, many who stay in the shadows, who eventually come to grips with what has been done, the horrible sin, and they come forward through great ministry of Project Rachel, which I've been involved with, the great uh, ministry of Project Rachel, wonderful organization, that is a means of healing, spiritual healing for women and men who have been touched in their lives by the unspeakable sin. I don't speak this theoretically. I have personal experience. I've been in the room with women who perhaps over years Years of silent shame, silent regret. You know, it's all done in the name of liberty and choice. And a woman always, always comes to regret that choice. Always. And as I say, it can take years. It can take years. But when they come, when they come to Project Racial, they are met with compassion. Compassion. And they go through the process of grieving and repentance and contrition and receiving the Lord's mercy in the sacrament of penance. And in, that, in those moments, it's been some of the most profound moments of my priesthood, for which I'm very grateful to God to be his instrument of mercy. Project Rachel. Now, if we are so callous as a culture to accept the taking of innocent human life where it begins. It's no wonder that today there's now more and more acceptance of euthanasia. 
more and more acceptance of euthanasia. And we cannot accept it. That too is an abomination to willfully take the life of another because it is inconvenient or not matching the quality, so-called, that society accepts it to be. No. And I would recommend to all of us, I've read it myself, I find it to be very good, very helpful. For those who are thinking about end-of-life decisions, where we actually respect the dignity of the human person at the end of life for ourselves and others, to read Father Kirby's, K-I-R-B-Y-S, wonderful little uh, booklet called We Are the Lords, a paperback that goes over some important issues that we face, can face, at the end of life, at the end of life. But these sins are not acceptable. They are certainly not to be viewed as normative behavior in any society, much less a democracy. And this brings me to the time of our election. We're in an election campaign, we all know it. But no Catholic with a well-formed conscience in the interest of justice can vote for a politician at any level of government who supports the unspeakable sin. It is impossible. Why? Because when we vote, we vote with our deepest identity as Catholics. We take our Catholic identity with us into the voting booth. And if we're mailing the ballot in and we're sitting down at the table and we're filling out that ballot, we do so as Catholics. As Catholics. And therefore, we have a responsibility in that very action, which could be a virtue, of choosing what is good. And that means affirming the dignity of human life. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And we cannot, should not, must not corrupt our conscience, our decision, by seeing it any other way. And so, dear brothers and sisters, these moral virtues that we've been considering today, we must remember that they were infused within us by God at baptism. We must make them an active part of our lives, and we must encourage one another to practice them. That's key, too, to encourage one another in virtue. Again, we're all in this together. If we are giving God the best of ourselves, then we can be confident that we are living virtuously and that we are indeed bearing good fruit. Then St. Paul's words of assurance will resonate with us. Have no anxiety at all. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.